Okay, can you see this red dot moving around? Yeah, we can, we can see both your, 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 the end of your cursor. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah then, then that should be fine. I'm going to share other things in, in the middle. So, okay. and also, I have my, my laptop, uh, sorry, my iPad is also connected in case there are questions and I can write something. Maybe can we just try this if, um, uh, okay. Uh, then I have to unshare it. Well, okay, when it comes to, to actually, I mean, I can write something on my iPad. So, so if people have questions, I, I will share the iPad, but I think that should work. No problem. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, so we're happy to welcome John McManga as a, the third lecturer of the school. So John is a physicist working on string theory and quantum field theory with a particular interest in gauge gravity duality and its application. And she's the author, one of the authors of the famous book on gauge gravity duality that is maybe the standard textbook in the field. So she's going to give us four lectures as an introduction to the physics of gauge gravity dualities aimed at philosophers so that we can finally know what we're actually talking about instead of just <laughs> talking our mouths. And, uh, and as usual, the format is just two hours of lecture and uh, you, you are free to, you are welcome actually to ask as many questions as you feel like during the lecture so that Joanna can engage how much, uh, how, how to proceed with the lectures if they need to be slower or she can go faster. So please ask as many questions as you see fit and don't hesitate to just interrupt and, uh, and ask. Okay, I think I've said everything. So Joanna, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. So thanks very much for the invitation. As I said, I'm really sorry that I can't be there. I really was looking forward to traveling to Obino, which I think is a lovely place and uh, it's very famous for philosophy and particular philosophy of science, but unfortunately I broke my arm. So uh, last week, just the day uh, before my as last Sunday. And uh, okay, so I'm a bit stuck here, but fortunately I, I broke my right hand, but I'm left-handed. So um, if there's questions I can write on my iPad. So that's already good. Um, okay, so the next important remark is that I'm a physicist. Okay, so I'm a real <laughs> physicist. And for me, it's extremely hard to judge um, what the level of my lecture should be, because I, of course, I would like you to learn something, but I don't want to go into too many complicated details, but also on the other hand, I don't want to tell you things that you already know. So um, please, you know, I, I need a lot of feedback from your side. Just ask as many questions as you like. And I, I'm very flexible to answer the question. I think it's much more important to, to really have to engage in some dialogue. And I, I don't have to reach any particular goal. I just want to, you to learn as much uh, about gauge gravity duality as you can. Um, okay, so let me get started and really please interrupt me at any time and uh, I can go into more details if you'd like and, uh, and also I can skip things if you already know them. Okay, so that said, so I'm a physicist, but uh, so this is a lecture introducing gauge gravity duality to philosophers. Uh, so okay, no, I can't. Yeah. Okay. So maybe let me make a few general remarks at the beginning. Um, so okay, I'm going to talk for one hour, and then I think we should have five minute break, and then I continue for another hour before we have the longer break. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, where Würzburg is because it's a rather small town in the north of Bavaria, or rather a part of Germany called Franconia, which is a part of Bavaria. And uh, I'm sure it's not quite as beautiful as Ovino, but uh, it's not too bad. <laughs> There's a river called Main, um, which is the same as in Frankfurt or Sulmino, okay. And here there is a famous uh, Baroque castle of the Prince Bishop who used to be here. And he invited uh, the famous Italian painter Tiepolo to make uh, draw a fresco in the staircase. And, and that's a UNESCO World Heritage painting. So, um, you know, I'm, no, I'm sure there's lots of paintings by Tiepolo in uh, Italy, but if you want to see a very beautiful one, it's actually here. Würzburg is a strange uh, German no name, but there's a Latin Greek version, which is called Herbie Polis, which is a good translation of uh, Würzburg. Okay. <laughs> and um, so now just to tell you where this is. So Würzburg is there. And you see that there's Munich here and there's Frankfurt uh, uh, there. And we are on the same river as Frankfurt. So it's actually closer to Frankfurt than uh, uh, Munich, which is our capital. 
Okay, and as a last piece of information, so this is our group working on gauge gravity duality. Here you can see me. And so there's really many people here in Würzburg involved in this kind of research, and just to introduce them to you. And uh, so, of course, a lot of the work is also done by my collaborators, and I should be grateful to them. Okay. Um, all right. So let's start with the physics. And uh, so the aim of these lectures that I'm going to give to you um, is to explain to you what gauge gravity duality is, because so duality in particular is this word which is in the title of the um, conference or school. <laughs> and um, so, so to start, I mean, physicists tend to be extremely brief, and I think you want to learn a lot of detail about the concepts and so on. So, but let me just start with this very brief slide. So um, I would just say for now that duality, uh, duality is a map, but um, okay, one purpose of this lecture is to explain in a lot more detail uh, what this map actually does, okay? And it's a map between um, a quantum field theory in flat space, which does not gra have gravity. And this quantum field theory in flat space is mapped to a gravity theory. So you have a, a map in the mathematical sense between a quantum theory which has no gravity and on the one hand side and the gravity theory on the other side. And that, of course, I expect is also very interesting to philosophers of science um, because it teaches us new things about the nature of uh, quantum theory, of course. Okay, so I should say that um, this is a new area of research uh, which uh, followed this very seminal paper by Malasena on the ADS-CFT correspondence in 1997. And okay, so that's certainly a paper that changed the life of many. So at the time, I was, when this paper appeared, I was a postdoc. And uh, so one morning I looked at the archive and there was this paper and I said, oh, this sounds interesting. But I was very young and you know, I, I didn't have a lot of oversight, but already then I could actually see right away that this was a super interesting paper. And certainly, I mean, certainly my career also uh, depended quite a bit on this proposal here. Okay. So the point of this lecture is to explain um, what, what the duality is to physicists or what this particular duality is to physicists. And um, apart from explaining the, the basic concept of this duality, I would also like to show you um, some ideas of finding further examples of, of the gauge gravity duality in addition to the original ADS-CFT correspondence. Uh, one other question that is interesting to physicists is to find criteria for, for QFTs to possess a gravity dual. And certainly one very big question is the following, that the original example of this duality, which is the ADS-CFT correspondence, um, arises from string theory. And so now a big question is uh, if this duality is actually valid more generally than um, beyond string theory. Okay, so and maybe you, you, you are interested to learn that I changed my mind on this. I mean, a long time, I just thought that this is very closely tied to string theory, but more recently, I have thought maybe that's actually not true. And um, this idea can be valid more generally, but certainly the best understood example is still the one which comes in the context of string theory. Okay, and uh, so, so as I will tell you, gauge gravity duality on one hand side has very fundamental aspects, but it was, has also these new applied aspects. And, and in the sense, this was uh, first a spin-off, but I think now it became also a bit of field on its own is the idea to calculate observables in strongly coupled quantum field theories from, from this gravity dual. And I want to explain this also a little bit. So I'm going to talk both about the fundamental aspects and also um, the um, applied aspects of this duality. And uh, well, I mean, one obvious thing I have to say at the beginning, and, and uh, this will appear all the time throughout the lectures, is that so far there is no mathematical proof of the gauge gravity duality. I mean, there's other examples of dualities in physics where um, actually, um, a proof is possible, but in this case, uh, it's it's not. And I, I will explain why it's so hard to prove this duality. So somebody would like to ask a question, I think. May I ask a very yeah, yeah, elementary sure. question? Yeah, thanks. So, you know, I've often heard, as you say, that this original example arises from string theory, but 
as you say, the map is between quantum field theory and phase space uh, and flat space yeah. and uh, gravity. So is the is the gravity the string theory? So I'm just like, where is the string in that? The way you said it initially. Okay, that's an excellent question. I spend I will spend almost the entire lecture today to explain exactly what I mean by this sentence. Okay, but it's a very good question. So um, I, I will explain this in great detail today. Okay, but let me just give you a flavor of the answer for now, which is by no means exhaustive. But what you are asking is exactly what I want to convey to you. Okay, so uh, uh, no, I was just asking uh, where the strings come in here because you yeah, said yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I want to, I will tell you where the strings come in, and the, the point is that this duality actually is a particular low energy limit of string theory. Okay, so in principle, so you start with these extended objects, which are strings. And, and then you take a low energy limit, which means you the resolution becomes very bad and or you go very far away from these strings and then you only see them as being points again. Okay, and then and, and then it's a, the low energy limit means you you make the resolution of your microscope uh, bad or, or on the other hand, you, you just go very far away from your strings and then they look like points, although they're not. Okay, so and, and, and I will show you that. And that's just precisely where this word duality comes in. Okay, so wait, be a little patient for me more details because this is exactly sure. what I want to explain. Okay, Sorry, so, thanks. Yeah. So, so there's a duality. Uh, so there's two different ways that you can. Um, so there's open strings and closed strings, and, and they have a duality between them. And, and then if you take this low energy limit, which I just mentioned, the, low, the, the open strings, they will give you the quantum field theory and the closed strings will give you the gravity theory. Okay, so that's the idea. But it's an excellent question because this is just exactly what I want to explain. Okay, okay excellent. So we will get there. Um, the only thing I wanted to do before I really enter all the details. Um, so now uh, let me, sorry, I, um, I wanted to sh quickly share something else which I discovered while I was um, sorry, uh, while I was preparing these lectures and um, just to give you some more flavor about what the, um, okay, so let me share again. Okay, so this is a paper that I found while I was preparing these lectures. And um, so this is by Dr. Lauren Greenspan, who is in New York, and this appeared uh, just a few weeks ago. And um, I thought, so this is, uh, uh, I think she has a PhD in physics, but she's um, now working in history and philosophy of science. And um, so it was very interesting because I'm a physicist and she exactly describes my work <laughs> in terms of, of, from the perspective of a philosopher. And uh, so just to, to give you a little more motivation now at the beginning is the following. Um, and so she writes, so that's the abstract of her paper, and I just wanted to read this quickly to you and make some comments from my perspective as being a physicist, just to give you some of the ideas that I would like to discuss later on. So she writes, uh, so um, I'm quoting this paper, okay, so as the archive number, you can see the archive number here, so it's pretty recent. So based on string series framework, the gauge gravity duality, also known as holography, so I'm going also to explain why it's called holography has the ability, I hope you can read this, okay, has the ability to solve practical problems in low energy physical systems like metals and fluids. Okay, so, I mean, the word duality will appear in many contexts here. So, and one duality is that on one hand side, we have these very fundamental questions like quantum gravity and, you know, the theory of everything and so on. But on the other hand, there's also this very applied side to gauge gravity duality. Um, where you can study metals and fluids. Okay, so this is very applied. And so in this paper, she is actually talking about this more applied side, but this is also what my research focus was on quite a bit. So I can say a little bit about this. Okay, holographic applications open a path for conversation and collaboration between the theory driven high energy culture of string theory and fields like nuclear and condensed matter physics which in contrast plays great emphasis on the empirical evidence that experiment provides. Yeah, so, so let me comment from my own experience. Yeah, so, so this is exactly true. So, and it's actually fun, the, the, the fun of this field. 
that on the one hand side, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a string theorist, I, mean, I work on this very fundamental aspects of uh, theory of everything and so on. But now uh, I have a lot of interaction with people working in nuclear and condensed matter physics, especially here in Würzburg, there's a big community in condensed matter physics. And now actually we have pro projects together with people from these very different cultures. And uh, this is actually a lot of fun. And at the beginning, it's a lot of work to get, you know, the framework to, to be actually able to talk to each other. Um, but uh, it's been very fruitful and successful. And I would like to show you a little bit about this also in this talk, okay? So on one side, we have this uh, theory-driven high energy culture, and then there's the other people who place great emphasis on the empirical evidence, okay? So, and now we're combining these things together and it's, it's really exciting, okay? Uh, so this paper so this paper by Dr. Greenspan takes a look at holography's history from its roots in string theory to its present day applications that are challenging the cultural identity of the field. Okay, so there's a lot of things going on. So uh, Dr. Greenspan writes in her paper, I will focus on two of these applications, holographic QCD and holographic superconductivity. And, and these are examples, of science, but I, I can provide you many more examples. I, I will provide some, some more examples in, in this talk. Okay. Highlighting some of the often incompatible historical influences, motives, and epistemic values at play, as well as the subcultural shifts that help the collaborations work. Okay, so I will give you some hands on experience as being a physicist of these subcultural shifts. Okay. <laughs> um, the extent to which holographic research, arguably string theory's most successful and prolific area, or I am very flattered to hear this, of course, <laughs> okay, uh, must change its subcultural identity in order to function in fields outside of string theory, reflects its changing nature and the uncertain future of the field. Okay, here I'm not quite sure uh, what is meant by uncertain future of the field. I mean, we have tons of things to do. I think uh, I'm very busy <laughs> and I'm not sure, well, I hope my future is not uncertain. And okay, maybe I can discuss this a little bit as we go along and look at the examples. Okay, does string theory lose its identity in the low energy application that holography provides? So this is a question and my answer is no, okay. <laughs> And, and it's very interesting to see that on one hand side, we still have this, um, you know, as was said here, this high energy driven uh, fundamental physics, which is still very much at heart of, of the whole scenario. But on the other hand, now we talk to our colleagues who, who look at uh, experiments and, uh, but okay. So if this is um, a question, my answer to this question is no, okay. And I, this is, I mean, these are all the things I want to explain. I, I just want to use this as give you some motivation for the lecture. Does holography still belong under string series umbrella or is it designed to form new subcultures with each of its fields of application? And wait, okay, so I already just mentioned this on my own slide a little bit. Um, um, I think holography does still belong under string series umbrella and you know it's this two sided story of being both very fundamental and very applied. So, so my, my answer to this question would be yes, okay. And, and, you know, um, and the new subcultures, I, I would still say, I mean, of course, we, we collaborate a lot with our people, uh, co colleagues in condensed matter physics, but I mean, it's not really to the stage yet that we find and form a subculture with them. I mean, it's still that, you know, they view us as the, these high energy uh, experts who are, you know, quite dif distinct from them. So, I mean, this is a bit, I think, a bit earlier, at least from my experience, okay. <clears throat> so, but Dr. Greenspan writes, I find that the answers to these questions are dynamic, interconnected, highly dependent on string theory's relationship with its field of application. Okay, we will see this. In some cases, holography can maintain the goals and values uh, it's inherited from string theory. I would be more strong, I would say, in all cases. Okay, and let me give you some examples. In others, in, instead, yeah, question? Was there a question? Okay, I'm not sure. Uh, just interrupt me if you have a question. Um, uh, it, in, it instead adopts the goals and values of the field in which it is applied. Okay, well, let's discuss this uh, using the examples that I will show to you. And these examples highlight a growing need for the STS community to expand its treatment of string theory 
regarding its relationship with empiricism and role as a theory of quantum gravity. Well, okay, I guess that's why you invited me to this um, school, okay. <laughs> and and I, I will ho hopefully give you some input that you can use then um, to, to address these issues. Okay, so so let me go back to my slides. Now, I, I just thought that was very interesting that this is a topic which is being discussed obviously in the literature right now. And um, I think this is a very nice um, paper. And you know, being a physicist, I think I can give you a lot of uh, examples and insight in these in this tension between these very formal and these more applied aspects of uh, gauge gravity duality. All right, uh, let me go back to my slides. Um, <clears throat> let me try to go full screen again. So can you see my, my mouse moving? Okay, good. All right. Okay. Okay, so given this introduction, um, I see, I, I hope you see that, um, you know, um, what I want to show to you in this lecture is to find further examples of the sketch gravity duality beyond the original ads safety correspondence, which was very firmly rooted in string theory. And, and then I've addressed this question in red here, um, you know, is the original, um, the original example arises from string theory, but is, it, is the duality valid more generally? I, I hope I can say a little bit about this. Although of course this is an, an unanswered question so far, okay. And um, I will show you these applications that were mentioned in this paper that I showed to you about calculating observables in strongly coupled uh, QFTs, quantum field theories from, from the gravity dual. Okay, and before we enter the detail, let me stress again, I mean, um, so far there's no mathematical proof of uh, gauge gravity duality. So it's still at the level of a conjecture, but it's an extremely useful conjecture. And I, I will also explain why it is so hard to actually prove this duality. Good, okay, so let me give you some um, oversight uh, of um, what I'm going to talk about. So, um, okay, so as I already mentioned, uh, there's two points which I have to address. One is the more the foundations of uh, gauge gravity duality and the other ones is applications. And um, so I'm going to um, explain to you uh, the origin of gauge gravity duality using this example of the ADS-CFT correspondence, which was proposed by Malasena in 1997, which is the best understood example and firmly rooted in string theory. And I will also explain how to test uh, this um, duality. And then on the other hand, um, I, I will show you some applications, uh, both to um, QCD or high energy physics uh, theories, but also to, to condensed matter physics. That's what I've been working on mostly recently. Um, so I can give you many examples here. Okay, so but here you see the outline and let me start with the, with the foundations. Um, also, I, one other point I should mention is that I, I realized that many other of the lecturers at the school, um, they will mention this relation between geometry, entanglement, uh, quantum information and uh, gravity, which is also extremely topical. And I, I will also, and, and, and a very recent development, and I will also mention some examples um, regarding this uh, as we go along. Okay. Um, because that's certainly also very important in this context that I'm addressing here. Okay, now I'm going to start. Okay, and um, so so thanks for asking this question. Where are the strings in the picture? So so that's where I want to reach uh, today. I mean, it, in the first hour even, um, and explain to you where how does string theory generate this duality. Okay, so the most important word, of course, in gauge gravity duality is this word duality. And um, are there, is there any question? I think people, no, okay, good. So, so a duality, um, so let me try to give you a definition, a kind of very general practical working definition of what I mean by a duality. And of course, this word has lots of meanings, and many of them will actually show up in the context here. Okay. Um, so here, I, I just want to say that a duality means that a physical theory has two equivalent formulations. Um, 
in the sense that, um, okay, so essentially I have two different Lagrangians or Hamiltonians. So I suppose everybody knows what a Lagrangian Hamiltonian is. Okay, so, yeah, sorry if this is a very basic question to you. I, I just want, I mean, please interrupt me if I'm using words that you don't know. Okay, but I guess Lagrangian is familiar to everybody. So what's a physical theory to us? It's, it's, it's a Lagrangian made of some particular fields, okay? And um, so um, then if this physical theory has two equivalent formulations in terms of two different Lagrangians made out of different degrees of freedom, different fields, but nevertheless, um, the dynamics is the same. And there's a one-to-one -one map between the states in these, um, in these two formulations then then I would call this a duality. And okay, so I can make this even more pictorial. Okay, so imagine here you have some physical system, um, which you could even imagine of being a physical system in your lab. And then you have two physical theories. And so if a physicist says, I have a theory, it means that he or she has uh, an action or Lagrangian or Hamiltonian made out of some degrees of freedom. And assume that this theory describes this physics in this physical system, but then you have another theory or another Lagrangian that uh, is made out of other degrees of freedom and describes the same physical system, and then obviously there must be a relation between these two theories. And, and this relation, uh, I would call a duality here. Yeah. So this is a very, very general physics hands-on definition of what duality means. Okay, so it's a relation between two different Lagrangians that describe the same physical system. Now, uh, coming back to this, I mean, you could now even imagine your physical system in a lab, something real, okay, in the world, okay. <laughs> but uh, today, um, so that comes back to the question that was asked earlier, um, the system will be so-called D-brains, okay, D-brains in string theory. And they will have these two different descriptions, and 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 these two descriptions will be at the heart of this gauge gravity duality. Okay. Um, all right. So actually, this general concept of a duality arises quite a lot in physics, and uh, so there there are some extremely well known um, dualities, like the ones between the massive Searing model and the sine Gordon theory. So this is a duality between bosons and fermions in one plus one dimensions, but that's a duality where you have two quantum field theories, and that's a super well understood um, a super well understood duality where. Um, you can actually write down the map that maps this one theory to the other one. And, but there's no gravity in this simple example. So the sine Gordon of steering duality, it's called. Um, but so the very special thing about this gauge gravity duality is that it's the only example so far known, okay, where on one hand side, you have a gauge theory, which is a quantum field theory and which has no gravity. But that's actually dual in the sense that I show in this diagram to a, a gravity theory in, in higher dimensions. Okay, there's a question. Okay, very good. Let me look at the chat. You can't see the slides moving. Oh, that's bad. Okay, yes. Uh, okay, so then um, you haven't seen my slides, then obviously it's pretty meaningless what I'm saying. Okay, let me try to share again. Sorry about this. Thanks for pointing this out. Um, can you see them moving now? Okay. Can you now see the slides moving? Now, now we can see. Okay, I'm really, really sorry. Okay, then it was pretty pointless what I was doing. Uh, okay, let, let, let me backtrack then a little bit. Um, okay, sorry about this. Um, okay, so this you still saw, okay? And did you see this diagram at all? No, okay, sorry, no, no, I have to redo this because otherwise you, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Okay, so did everybody see this slide? Yes, that one was already. I want me so, okay, good, sorry. Okay, <laughs> now let me recapitulate what I said because it's pretty meaningless without this, the, the diagram. I was talking about the diagram. Okay, so I said a duality is a physics definition of the word duality means that a physical theory has two equivalent formulations. 
which have the same dynamics and there's a one-to-one -one map between states, okay? And so this is the important diagram that I was talking about um, for the last five minutes, okay? So uh, I was saying that you have one theory um, made out of a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian um, and uh, that describes some physical system. And then you have another theory with a different Lagrangian action or Hamiltonian made out of different degrees of freedom. But this theory also describes the same physical system. So if this theory describes the physical system and that physical theory describes that system, there must be a relation between them. And that's what I call a duality, okay? All right, sorry. I, I mean, okay, this is the diagram I was talking about before. <laughs> Okay, so and so then, as I said, gauge gravity duality is this very special duality where you have a duality in this very general broad physics sense, okay, where um, we have a theory which is a gauge theory that is a quantum field theory without gravity, and that's dual in this sense that I've drawn here to a, a gravity theory in, in higher dimensions, okay. So, so the gauge gravity duality, so I was mentioning before, there's many dualities in physics, especially in quantum field theory and one plus one dimension quantum field theories, you can to map two quantum field theories to each other. And there everything is absolutely well understood. The only issue being that um, there's no gravity and, and gauge gravity duality, that's what the name says, is the only known example where you actually map a quantum field theory without gravity uh, to a gravity theory in higher dimensions. Now, um, already at this stage, of course, that poses lots of questions about the nature of gravity, okay? So if I tell you that gravity is actually the same as a theory without gravity, then you start wondering if it's really fundamental. I mean, if you really push it to the end, which I'm not going to do, okay? But you might want to push this to the end and say, okay, if a gravity theory in high dimensions is equivalent to a quantum theory in lower dimensions, but uh, without gravity, then is gravity fundamental question mark? I mean, you might ask this, okay, but I'm not going to do it, but just mention this possibility. Is there a question? No? Okay. Um, okay, so, so here already at this level, you might ask, you know, if gravity is really something fundamental in nature. Um, uh, wait. Okay, let's leave this as an open question. I would still say yes, but um, you know, given this relation, um, maybe this is not so obvious anymore. Okay, I hope you can see the next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, so gauge gravity duality is a conjecture which follows from a low energy limit of string theory. I mentioned this uh, uh, since somebody asked towards the beginning. So, um, so this is still a conjecture. And um, so now there's uh, the word duality also appears in a slightly different sense. So remember this, so, I mean, this is something you have to remember for all of my lectures that when I use say duality, I, I mean, a relation between two theories written in terms of different Lagrangians that describe the same physics. But there's another meaning of the word duality, uh, which means that um, uh, one key issue here is that a quantum field theory at strong coupling, okay, is mapped to the theory of gravitation at weak coupling. So that's a strong weak duality, which also appears a lot in physics. And I, I will explain a little more what I mean by uh, quantum field theory as strong coupling, okay? Um, but I, I, let me just point out that another meaning of the word duality in physics is that you go from a coupling and then go to another theory where the coupling is one over the original coupling. So this means a very big coupling becomes a very small coupling, okay? And that's interesting because um, at weak coupling, there are some very standard techniques for doing calculations, whereas theories at strong coupling, they're extremely hard to solve. So this is also something useful just from a calculational point of view, because essentially it means that you can map unsolvable problems to solvable problems, which sounds too, too good to be true, okay? <laughs> I mean, if it were so easy that you can map all unsolvable problems to solvable problems, then uh, physicists would be very happy, but um, there are some catches. I mean, the problem is that it doesn't work for any theory that you just pick. It only works for particular examples. And one difficulty is to find those examples where this makes sense, 
Okay. Okay, then um, another word which is very important, which also was mentioned in this paper that I mentioned to you earlier, is the word holography. Okay, so, and this relates to a hologram, which I showed here. Okay, so what is a hologram? This is something where there's an information in a volume, say in three dimension, which um, is stored in a two dimensional surface. Okay, so you have a volume with a with a surface surrounding it and the same amount of information is inside the volume and at its surface um, that's called the holographic principle and there's many situations in, in physics where this actually happens and um, certainly this is one of them and in fact what happens is that the quantum field theory uh, in this duality is in d dimensions but its dual gravitational theory is in d plus one dimensions okay and um, so you can imagine that your quantum field theory fits at the boundary um, of this uh, volume in which the gravitational theory is defined um, and uh, so that goes under the name of holography because we store the same information in this d-dimensional surface as in the D plus one dimensional volume. So, so both the information content of the two is the same, but also the number of degrees of freedom. So I, I, I guess you know that physicists like to talk about degrees of freedom and degrees of freedom is the number of, the, um, is the number of variables you have in a given problem, okay? So for instance, um, if you just look at a pendulum, and you just have one mass uh, point mass which goes on this, um, you know, is constrained to run on the circle because it hangs on the pendulum. Then uh, the only degree of freedom that you have is the angle, which tells you the um, angle phi, which tells you the deviation from the from being perpendicular. So that would be problem with just, a problem with just having one degree of freedom. Now, obviously, in quantum field theory, there, there, one problem of quantum field theories is that they have an infinite amount of degrees of freedom. Um, but um, the, the point is that the number of degrees of freedom per volume here in, in this gravitational theory um, scales actually with the, the boundary, so it would, uh, the surface in one dimension less. And so per volume, um, the number of degrees of freedom here is the same as in an area element at the boundary. Okay. So that's very important to, to understand this as well. And I will give more explanations of this uh, as we go along. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, so let me move on, but okay, so Again, if, if, if everybody knows this already, you know, just tell me, then I, I'm going to go much faster. I, I'm <laughs> I just... okay, Hans, to... May I ask something? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, my, my question is very generic. Um, when you say quantum field theory in the, the holography yeah. and also in duality, this quantum field theory is only a mathematical fact or is something more connected with the standard model? Okay, yeah, this is an excellent question. Yeah, thanks for asking. And I, I will give you more details about this. Okay, so the answer is that in the ADS-CFT correspondence, okay, okay, good. Maybe, maybe let me, okay, then if, if, if possible, let me see if I can uh, share my, um, can I share my laptop? I hope you, you will be able to. Um, can I share the content? Um, yeah, so I'm sharing the screen and now let me. So can you see my screen? Yeah, it says lecture one Ovino, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, so if I say, but, no, it's not writing. Sorry. If I write uh, quantum field, oh, sorry, wrong. Yeah. 
So can you see me writing here, quantum field theory? Okay. Yes, okay. yes, we can. Okay, so so a quantum field theory, normally you have a Lag Lagrangian. No, it's not writing again. Uh, sorry, why it started out nicely, but then I'm sorry. Ah, okay. Okay. So um, then, so if you if you know the standard model, okay. So then you have a Lagrangian density. And um, okay, it starts with some gauge field. Um, so so this f mu nu is d mu a nu minus d mu a nu, and then you have some fermions, and uh, there's the Higgs field. Okay, and so so all these things enter, enter, and and in the standard model you have this gauge group which is su three times. SU2 times U1. Okay, so you have the strong weak and electromagnetic forces and so on. So okay, so so th these AMUs they, they would versus be the gluons, okay, and then your fermions there, they have the quarks. And so on and so on. Okay, so so if you talk about a standard model, this is what you have in mind. Okay, so so and these quarks and 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 the gluons, they, they have been measured accelerators. So these are particles that really exist. Okay, so or I would say where the theory matches the experiment. And um, so if you go to CERN and do a measurement of some, uh, I don't know, quark decaying into gluons and so on, you can calculate the cross-section and this is something which is absolutely real in the, in the physics sense. Now, um, if we go to the ADS-CFT correspondence, then um, we have here the field theory side is this thing which is called a conformal field theory. Okay. And so it's in three plus one dimensions. So this the standard model obviously is also in three plus one dimensions because our real world is in three plus one dimensions. We have space and time, okay. And um, but the, the here the, the story is that again we have a Lagrangian, so we have a, a supersymmetric gauge theory. So we have a gauge theory, so there will also be. Uh, fermions, but they will be so called gauge genos, and then there will be scalar fields with some kinetic term. Okay, so so these are called gauge genos. So these are the the super partners of of these gauge fields which are here, and here we have some scalar fields which are again super partners here. Okay, so, so it's a it's a very symmetric quantum field theory. You know my pen is in writing. So, and the, the message is that formally, okay, the theory here um, looks very much the same as the standard model, but uh, in this very, the, the most basic example of ADS-CFT or the, the, the best understood correspondence, it is a theory with a lot more symmetry than the standard model, okay? And in particular, the theory has so-called scale invariance. Okay, so what does it mean to have scale invariance? This mean uh, so assume you know you have you sit on some ball and there's some physical process happening here, and then you inflate this ball to, to get this big, but still the physics doesn't change. Okay, that that's something which is extremely rare. Okay, so normally if you change the scales so for instance in the in the standard model you have um, um, confinement and asymptotic freedom this means if you go to very low energies and so so for instance if you have confinement um, then you have a quark and you have an anti-quark and there's some flux tube 
And um, okay, so now um, th these quarks cannot be free. If you start pulling on them, okay, then um, then there will be an attractive force happening. And, and um, so this is the, the cold, so-called confinement. So these quarks that you cannot see them individually in nature, but so so confinement means that there is no scale invariance because if you change the scale, then the physics changes. Okay. But um, in the ADS CFT correspondence, there's the CFT is a very particular quantum field theory. So where we can write a Lagrangian, just as I did before. So, so something like this, okay. But um, the, 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 the fields which I enter here are not seen in nature. Okay, it's just a mathematical construction. I mean, it's a valid quantum field theory in the sense it's a renormalizable quantum field theory. It's in three plus one dimensions. It's well defined uh, from the point of view of theoretical physics and so on, uh, but it doesn't describe anything in nature. I mean, you know, you can invent lots of quantum field theories and not all of them are realized um, in, in some physical system. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, may I say something? Yes, I understood the perfectly. Uh, then my question is: uh, um, Is there that uh, a, a quantum conformal quantum field theory something very mathematical? Uh, but uh, it, perhaps is it possible to find uh, in the correspondence something uh, on the boundary that is more similar to standard model? A, that this is not a, a standard uh, road of research. Yes, exactly. That's an excellent question because this is exactly uh, what I want to say. So, so the original ADS CFT correspondence. Uh, so includes. This is, I mean, I'm just repeating your question, but this is exactly the research question that every, many people are working on. Okay, so the original ADS safety correspondence includes a conformal field theory. Uh, so, conformal field theories are abbreviated by CFT. And so, this is not, I mean, this and this is the name of the theory is NX24 SU. Sorry, SUN Super Young Mills theory. <coughs> no, my pen doesn't work anymore. Oh, come on. I'm something. something wrong. Sorry about this. I don't know. My my iPad somehow. But I think I have this written this somewhere. Okay, let's. Then if it doesn't work, let me go back to uh, to my slides because I'm, I must have written this somewhere because this is exactly the point. Uh, so the name of the series N X four Super Young Mills theory. So this is this very academical CFT. And then the question is, can we make this work also for say for the standard model? Yeah, that would be extremely useful. And and the answer is in some sense yes but not entirely okay so so and this is just the, the complicated thing that people would like to to so okay so this now it's work writing again so so this is um okay so that's the name of this very academical um so it's super super means it's a super symmetric theory there's a symmetry between fermions and bosons and so on so and now the question is, you know, um, does the duality also work for theories, i.e., Lagrangians that describe something in nature? So th that's the question that you ask, yeah, and and that's but that's the question that many people ask, and that's actually the topic of a lot of research. 
and, and let me try to sketch. So the answer is complicated, <laughs> but I, I will give you some example. I mean, um, um, so, so this is an entire area of research. Which also goes under this name of gauge gravity duality. Okay. And um, so, so let me say, I mean, this is some of the things I, I will also explain um, later today. Um, so, one problem, so um, it is possible uh, to make progress. So, and I will show you examples, uh, but um, some features cannot be changed. And then, so for instance, for example, um, so in the original S um, ADS CFD correspondence, so I said there's this SUN gauge group. And as I will explain to you, um, this, this rank of the gauge group is something which has, has to be infinite, okay? So there is a limit of taking this N to be infinite, okay? And, and this thing, this limit cannot really be removed because then you remove the entire feature. And, and that's actually one reason also why this correspondence is so hard to prove, okay? Because it's impossible to undo this limit. But, so, but of course, if you know the standard model, you know that QCD is an SU3 gauge theory, okay? So obviously three is not infinite. So this means I can make statements about N being infinite, but the real world in QCD, we have uh, SU3. And then the big question is, you know, are the statements that I'm making still meaningful, although I know that I, I'm not in the same regime that, you know, my limit is n to infinity and not n is equal to three. Okay, so that's an example for one of these questions that people try to address. So, so, so it, you know, uh, so the duality does not work directly for the standard model. Okay, but um, are there features of the standard model? So standard model, I abbreviate with SM, that we can still describe uh, in a physical sense. sense, although we know that we have n going to infinity and not n is equal to three. And that's the whole game of gauge gravity duality research, okay? You have to find those corners of physics where you can still say something meaningful, although you know that you don't have exactly the, the, the Lagrangian that you need. Okay, and, and this is, okay. So now you might say uh, that sounds strange and, but um, this is exactly what I would like to explain also in, in these lectures, um, you know, that it still makes sense to, you know, you can still e extract information, although you know that real Lagrangian is not exactly the one that's realized in nature. Okay, and that's the whole art. And that's why this is an art in physics and not mathematics, okay, because we know that we work with something which is not realized, but still it can be useful. And uh, so, um, so this is the research question. of gauge gravity duality. Find examples where this is meaningful.
Okay, and I, I, I will show you examples where this actually makes sense. Okay, so this is one point of one message I would like to convey in, in the lectures. Okay, th does this answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, okay, good. Then let me stop this again. Okay, let me go back to the, um, get me go back to the slides. Uh, okay, so now I should need to share them again and to make sure that. Okay, uh, no, it's again, this sharing is paused, so that doesn't that work. Okay, now you can see my slides moving, yeah, okay. Yes, yes. Okay, good. All right, so we were here. Okay, so I should be uh, more precise in saying it, there are particular quantum field theories in the dimensions where this works. Okay, and so it's now an entire art, or the research question is to find, you know, if you have a given physical problem, does the theory for this work, for which this works, does still sufficiently describe your 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 physical problem? Okay, I, I, okay, I will give you examples and then it, I, I hope this will become a lot more clear. Good, so that was the story about um, the, the, the hologram and the different dimensions that are involved. Okay, so that will also, this is also a recurring theme of these lectures that will come back. Okay, um, I will come to this question that we just discussed uh, that you just asked um, in, in detail uh, very soon, but let me just take a little de detour to this holography. So, and so as in the hologram, the, the same amount of information, the same amount of degrees of freedom is stored once in the volume and once in the surface. And okay, so that, that refers to the so-called holographic principle, which uh, has been around already for a long time, a long, even before ADS-CFT, this was already around, okay. So this holographic principle states that the information of a theory in a given volume is entirely stored in the boundary surface of that volume. And, and this, this principle is inspired by the, the Bekenstein Hawking black hole entropy formula that you see here. So, where the entropy of a black hole is proportional to the area of the black hole uh, divided by four times Newton's constant. Okay. So, so really, the, the entropy of the black hole is given by the area of its um, surface, okay, at the Schwarzschild horizon. And, and so, because th this is peculiar, because normally the entropy scales with the volume in physics. And here, in this case, it scales with the area. And, and that leads to this holographic principle. And so, that seems to be a um, rather generic feature in quantum gravity that will come uh, more, that we will encounter many times. Okay, so um, just I, I like this example because it's actually very simple to, to Plato's cave. So just to make a connection to philosophy and something which probably everybody here knows. Okay, um, so this holographic principle is a little bit like Plato's cave. Okay, so if you remember, there's these prisoners uh, that look at this wall and they see all these shadows. And then some other people, they carry around here a cat and a table and, and, and there's a light here in the back. And so the real, real objects, they are always three-dimensional, but these poor prisoners, they, they are forced to look in this direction and they only see these shadows, these two-dimensional objects. <laughs> and holography is a bit the same, okay? So, so from the boundary point of view, we see these two-dimensional objects, but in principle, the entire information is stored um, um, in, in these, uh, these three-dimensional objects and there's a relation between the two, okay? Okay, so that was just a side remark to, to make connection to something which you surely know. Okay. And um, so now let me enter in more details of this um, about the physics. Okay. So let me start at the very beginning. Okay, so I'm a physicist. So, from what is physics? So, physics is the science of matter and its interactions. So, on one hand side, you have some kind of particles uh, in some general sense. And these particles, they, they interact with each other. Okay, so and this can happen in a lot of scenarios and circumstances, and, and we want to understand how they do. Okay, 
And um, so now let's come back to what I said at the very, uh, okay. I've already been talking for one hour, but let me just go for another 10 minutes and maybe then we have a short break, okay? So, um, so, so this, let me come back to what I said at the very beginning. So there's actually two different approaches. One is the one which I would call the kind of fundamental approach. Okay, so this is the, the question of string theory, for instance. So the idea is to find a unified theory of all the known interactions. So we say science, so this is the science of matter and its interactions. And now we want to find a unified theory of all known interactions. So on the standard model, we have electromagnetism, the weak and the strong force, and they can be quantized. <coughs> and as you all know, there's this big challenge um, of unifying them with gravity, but then there's a challenge because this need, means we have to quantize gravity such that all of these can be described in a unified uh, scenario, this theory of everything if you want, okay? But then on the other side, um, there's something which I would like to call the applied approach. Okay, so that's if you have condensed matter physics or nuclear physics and, and, and particle physics. So there, uh, again, uh, having in mind that physics is the science of matter and its interactions, <clears throat> Uh, we want to describe observers and processes and systems with a given interaction. And there, there's also a challenge there in physics, which is not quite as big maybe as this challenge of quantizing gravity, but still is, there's a challenge. And um, the challenge is that sometimes interactions can be strongly coupled. Okay, I will explain what I mean by strongly coupled in, in, in a minute, but this means uh, that calculations become hard to do. Um, so one example is young mill theory that you see here. And so if you go to very long, low energies, um, then um, particles get very strongly coupled. And, and um, so the, the calculations become complicated to do. And, uh, um, oops, I was going in the wrong direction. So, um, so then people in these more applied areas of physics, they, they fight, I mean, they have there are many issues, but one issue is to describe these strong, strongly coupled systems. And um, so they, they appear in, in particle physics, nuclear physics, but also in condensed matter physics. And uh, so here are some examples in, in, in condensed matter physics, uh, like uh, strongly correlated electron systems, high C superconductors, heavy fermions, and so-called vial semi-metals. Um, and and so, so there's a need of having techniques for, for dealing with the strong coupling. Okay, um, so, so what is strong coupling? So let me just explain this in using this picture. So uh, weak coupling means that we have some, okay, so physics is the science of particles and their interactions. So, so assume we have some, some particles and then we want to describe the physics of this particle interacting with those particles. Now, if, if the coupling is weak, then we can decompose this problem, okay? and look individually how this red particle interacts with this blue particle and that blue particle and that blue particle and that blue particle. And so we can have a series expansion and, and decompose everything in this kind of two particle interactions, okay? And this means uh, if we have some observable, we can perform a power series expansion that looks like this, okay? And um, so, so that's called weak coupling. And, and there's a, a well-defined procedure to deal with this, and this is called perturbation theory. Because you can treat the interaction as being a perturbation about um, the free or classical background. Now, if you have a strongly coupled system, this means that all the particles, they have these kind of springs between them, okay? This means if you wiggle one particle, all the other particles are also going to wiggle especially if you want to describe the physics of that particle and you move this particle around, it means that all the others are going to move in a kind of collective motion, okay? And then it means that this coupling constant will be bigger than one and then this power series expansion is no longer possible. And, and this means you cannot somehow decompose the interaction or the physics of this particle into interactions with the individual particles you have to have the, the whole motion of the collective system at once. And, and that's very hard, a very hard problem in physics and there's no known technique um, to solve this. So this is a totally 
well understood problem. It's like QCD at high energies, you do perturbation theory, you get precisions to five digit digits, and it's an absolutely well understood problem. But this thing is very complicated, and there's no gen generally accepted technique how to do this in general. So it's very welcome to have new techniques for explaining uh, such physical systems. <clears throat> okay. And now, um, so the message I want to convey now in the lectures is, okay, I gave you this fundamental approach of finding a quantum theory of gravity, and then this applied approach of solving strongly coupled problems in, in say, condensed metaphysics. And now gauge gravity duality relates these two questions to each other. Okay, so, and, and so these two approaches, they are much more closely related than we first thought. So this question of finding a unified theory of gravity on one hand side, if you solve that, it gives you also new tools for solving these strongly coupled problems in other areas of physics. Okay. Okay, and, and this I want to explain in more detail. Okay, and, and so the idea is first to explain the ads cft correspondence where we talk about this rather abstract theory, but where everything is understood. Okay, or most of the things are understood. And then we will ask the question that you asked a little earlier, can we also do this for realistic physical systems? Okay, so this is the plan. Okay, I think it's a very good point to have a five minute break and unless somebody has a question right now. Okay, can you see it now? Can you see it moving? Yes, we can. Okay, okay good, good. All right, so this is where I stopped. So I said, um, um, the fundamental and the applied approach that I introduced are much more closely related than we thought. So this question for a theory of quantum gravity is related to this question of describing strongly interacting or strongly coupled particles. Okay, and um, so the idea is then really to, to map a strongly coupled quantum field theory. So for instance, QCD at low energies is such an example. Map this to a classical theory of gravitation. So this means we, we map the physics that happens in an event at the Riggs accelerator, for instance, or also at CERN, for instance. And there's um, a quark gluon plasma of strongly coupled particles. And some aspects of its physics can be described by doing calculations uh, for gravity in a black hole geometry. Okay, so, but I mean, I mean the, the, the real physics is here. I mean, this is now, if you want a mathematical tool to describe the physics here, okay. I mean, because um, one aspect is also that we look at gravity theories with a negative cosmological constant, okay, and they're, they're not real and they, they don't exist in the real world. But nevertheless, um, so it's really the idea that some aspects of QCD at low energies where we have the strongly covered system, regardless of this fact that not every entire aspect of our theory is exactly what we need because we have, don't have this large end. So we, we have to have to take this large end limit, which is not there in, um, in QCD. Nevertheless, we can describe some physics that's happening here by this gravity theory, okay? And I, I want to show you how also. So there's a very practical significance of the duality. So I can map a strongly coupled quantum field theory and to a weakly coupled classical theory of gravitation that is then solvable. And so I can do some calculations that I wasn't able to do in the original quantum field theory. Okay, and, and the most prominent example for this uh, is the so-called calculation of the so-called shear viscosity over entropy density, okay? So this goes to a, back to a very famous paper by these authors in 2004. And so that's the first example where people used a, a variant of this gauge gravity duality to calculate a physical observable that then this describes the, the physics of um, the quark gluon plasma in this accelerator. So we really start with something which is inspired by string theory and nevertheless, uh, we can use it to describe something that you can measure in an experiment. 
Okay, so that's of course conceptually very interesting. <laughs> Although of course the relation goes over some steps. Okay, it's not a direct verification of string theory in a lab, but nevertheless, there's a relation between some measurement and string theory, which goes over the sky to gravity duality. Okay, so let me just briefly explain what this is. So the shear viscosity is, uh, so assuming you have some fluid between two plates, and then you move one of the plates with some velocity, and then there's a, a gradient in the velocity here. So because the fluid um, has a viscosity, okay, so it's like honey or so it's, so there's some friction happening here. And this means the velocity becomes smaller if you go further into this fluid. <clears throat> And the strength of this gradient is the so-called shear viscosity. Now, <clears throat> you can form a so-called universal ratio, okay? So this keyword of universality is something which is very important in this entire business of using gauge gravity duality to describe real experiments. Um, because, uh, so universality in physics means that um, there are some macroscopic phenomena which don't depend on the microscopic degrees of freedom. And that doesn't happen very often, but there's occasions where this happens. And in particular, this is one particularly beautiful example where this happens. So and as these authors found, so if you, if you calculate the ratio between this shear viscosity coefficient and the entropy density, um, then gauge gravity duality, which is the strong coupling calculation using gravity, uh, gives you this results. And, and it doesn't depend on any of the parameters of the theory. And so that's the key. If you have this universality, then if you know, your physics doesn't depend on the microscopic degrees of freedom, then although we don't work exactly with the Lagrangian of QCD, we can still make a meaningful statements about the physics that's happening. And in particular, so it's more important to, to, to talk about this very strongly coupled theory rather than coupling, talking about the QCD Lagrangian like itself. And ADS-CFT gives this ratio, there's H bar and K Boltzmann, so two, two natural constants. And there's a factor here of one over four pi. So, and that's a rather small number, okay? So, so this gravity calculation, so the, the calculation is form, performed with the Lagrangian dis, describing this scenario gives me a result for the physics that's happening here. Okay. And so due to the universality, I mean, this, this, um, there's the only physics information really is the, the size of this coefficient. And there's no dependence on the precise model that I'm looking at. And that's called universality. And now, uh, astonishingly, uh, if a measurement of this shear viscosity over entropy density is performed in this accelerator here, uh, they actually confirm this result. Okay, as always, there's some grain of salt and so on and so on. There's, you know, we have to, there's, uh, you know, some, some amount of debate, but essentially you can, you can say that this is actually a number that has been measured in this uh, accelerator, okay? And that's, of course, a huge success of, for these string-inspired models. And so, so and the, the nice thing is because it doesn't depend on the details of the model, it it's, actually has been measured in very different scenarios in, um, in the quark-gluon plasma, which is in nuclear physics for cold atoms, and also more recently now even in, con in, in condensed matter or solid state physics. Okay, so, so because this doesn't depend on the parameters of the theory or the, the Lagrangian of the theory, uh, this, this universal relation appears in many different contexts and it was predicted by the gauge gravity duality calculation. Okay, so, so that's a very nice uh, motivation to, to look for other examples of this type. Okay, before I move on, uh, are there any questions about the slide? In uh, yeah, if, if I may, yes, sure. a, com a comment on this universality that you're speaking about, because uh, what I keep thinking of uh, basically this, uh, the ontological commitments of this sense of dualities that we've seen in these lectures. Yeah. So uh, my, my intuition is that basically the duality should somehow preserve 
basically something in that something is what basically we should give some ontological meaning. So I think that what you are basically referring to as universality is precisely that. I think that that captures the idea because otherwise it would seem passing, I mean, to basically have this uh, ratio that basically goes uh, across the uh, disparate system like core gluon plasma and coal yeah, atoms. Yeah. And of course, in, in many advanced uh, examples. So, um, so I, I mean, it's, I think that in these uh, dualities and between one thing, QFT, in, in classical theory of gravity, on the other hand, I mean, if if we are to commit ourselves to to some structure, I mean, that structure be preserved under that duality mapping, and I think that this is what the universality is basically capturing. Am I right? Yes, exactly. I mean, it's that, that's entirely right, and it's due to the fact that this is a quantity which depends does not depend on the precise details of the theory. So if you, if this, the, the, the synthesis ratio does not depend on the individual fields in the Lagrangian, then it can be captured by different models like the field theory and the gravity theory, as you just mentioned. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, um, yeah. So, so you have to have universal quantities and then your duality has a chance of working for this example. Okay, so, so I think that's, the order of things. I mean, um, because, because otherwise, without mm -hmm. this universality, I mean, this uh, would perhaps one should argue that it's just a mathematical devices or basically representational in terms of uh, it, it's hard to to basically accord them some uh, physical reality if that universality wasn't there. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I, I definitely agree with this because, um, um, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, if you cannot test the duality, then it's not meaningful to have it at all. <laughs> okay. And and these these universal quantities they provide a very nice test of um, of the duality. Yeah. So that that's the way I, I would put it. But yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, what you say, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. That was on physics remark. Maybe I shouldn't. Okay. So um, um, I here what I just wanted to say is um, okay. So this is a very so this is the first example that was found uh, now already some time ago, almost twenty years ago, and uh, so there there was a lot of. Um, interest in this result. Um, and so, so one of some of the work that I'm going to show later on is something I've worked on um, myself uh, is to find other examples of concepts in low energy quantum chromodynamics, for instance, chiral symmetry breaking and mesons. And the, 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 these provide other examples of quantities that you can compare in the QCD theory and, and, and also these gravity models. And I will come to those later. Just to say that you know this is a particular beautiful example of such a universal quantity, but there are others, and I, I will show to them. You, I, I will show them to you later. Okay, so this is a moment maybe to advertise my book, which uh, it was already mentioned. So I guess uh, you're all familiar with that. And um, okay, so so maybe let me just point to the fact it's called foundations and applications. So um, maybe to just explain briefly, if you have had a look at this book. So it comes in three parts. Okay, so it starts with those uh, concepts of physics that you need to know to understand duality. So there's quantum field theory, gravity, string theory, symmetries. And then the middle part is explaining the, the duality itself in terms of this very general uh, relation to string theory. Okay. And then it has a third part uh, where we talk about these applications like the one I just showed on the previous slide. So, so the structure of the book is um, rather similar to this argument I was giving here that on one hand side, we have a connection to string theory, but then we have also applications to other areas of physics. Okay, so I should say Martin Amon was my PhD student um, well, a long time ago. <laughs> 
And uh, now he's a professor in Jena, which is another nice university town in, in Germany. Okay, good. Now, okay, so I gave you some examples of applications, but now uh, let's go to this question that was asked at the very beginning. Okay, so where are the strings? Okay. <laughs> and uh, so this is where we are heading towards now because I want to explain to you very generally um, what um, the concepts of, of this duality are, okay? And I want to explain what the relation to quantum gravity, string theory, and so on is. Okay, so it's called the ADS-CFT correspondence, where ADS means anti Zitter space, and CFT means conformal field theory, okay? And that's the example where the duality was found, although at, in that case, it's a very abstract duality between two abstract mathematical concepts, which are two different Lagrangians, okay? And, uh, but I mean, this is one thing in physics that, you know, the more symmetries you have, the easier it's do, to do calculations, but the less close you are to reality. <laughs> that, that, that's always an issue in physics. There were some very beautiful toy models where you have a lot of symmetry and you can do beautiful calculations and everything is super nice. However, it has nothing to do with the real world. Okay, so that seems to be a general theme of physics. So let me explain this very beautiful, very well understood, very mathematically under control, very symmetric example first, which is the ADS-CFT correspondence. And then later we will go to, to these gauge gravity dualities that we can apply to the real world. And then we have to have a, um, you know, we have to get our hands dirty and get rid of some of the beauty. But okay, the beautiful things are always the easiest to explain. And, and that's why I, I concentrate on this for now. And also because it has a relation to string theory, which you're probably also interested in. Okay. Okay, what is an anti desitter space? Okay, so here you see a picture of an anti desitter space, which is due to, to Escher. Okay. And um, so what an anti desitter space is a space of constant negative curvature um, that has a boundary. So the boundary is very important for our holography that I already mentioned. Okay. So uh, this is the metric of the space. So this is a Minkowski metric. And then we get an extra dimension, which is this holographic dimension. And then here we have an extra factor, which again involves this coordinate, which is here at the back. Okay. And L is the so-called ADS radius. Okay. So in this space, is because it's constant negative curvature, it has a negative cosmological constant. And you know, there's some other ways of plotting this where this looks like a hyperbola, a hyperbola, with, uh, hyperbola. And um, so, um, of course, our universe is not an anti desitter space. Okay, so our universe is a desitter space, and there's it means that the, the metric looks slightly different. Okay, <clears throat> so in some sense, this is just a mathematical construction, but. It, it, it has some very beautiful mathematical properties, okay? <clears throat> Oops. So now if you wonder what these angels and devils are, okay? So uh, these are drawn there by Escher because if you project, so, so the anti sitter space looks like a, a can or, or a tin or a, a cylinder, which goes all the way to infinity, but um, one direction is time here. So if we cut at a constant moment in time, um, that's what you see, and the point is that these angels and devils, they all have the so same area, but in this projection, they look being more close to each other at the boundary than in the middle, okay? So, um, you are probably familiar with the Mercator projection of a sphere, okay? So, if you have a globe, uh, a picture of the, uh, of our world, okay, so the Earth, and then um, if you want to draw this on a map, which you can put on your desk, you have to use the so-called Mercator projection. And this means the South, the, the Greenland and the Antarctica on your map, they look much bigger than they are in nature. Okay, so the things which are close to the equator, they look much smaller on the map of the world than Antarctica and, and Greenland in the North Pole. Okay. And that's an effect of a positive positive curvature. So our Earth is positively curved, okay? It's a sphere. 
But here, this hyperboloid is negatively curved. And this means the things which are near the equator in the middle, they look, look much bigger than the things which are at the boundary. Okay, so it's the inverse of a positively curved object. Okay, so just to give you some intuition. So this is like a hyperboloid. And um, so this is the center of your anti space. Um, but then um, actually, it's actually an infinite distance to go all the way to the boundary. Okay, so it's a non-compact space. So the distance from here to the boundary is infinite because you see these things get smaller and smaller and smaller. And well, I mean, in, in the infinite, infinite limit, you reach the boundary, but um, still this distance uh, is infinitely long. Okay, so, so this is an anti sitter space. And the reason we look at is, it's that the symmetries of this mathematical space are the same as the conformal field theory, this, this conformal symmetry in the conformal field theory. So this is our curved space in which we have gravity and this conformal field theory, this will be defined on this blue boundary of the space. Okay. So, um, so now I explained what an anti sitter space is in ADS, but now we, I also have to explain what a CFT is. So a conformal field theory or CFT is a particular quantum field theory. And it has, again, a lot of symmetry. Okay, so the fields transform covariantly under conformal symmetry transformations. So that's the mathematical term of saying this. And uh, so what is a conformal coordinate transformation? Well, it's a transformation that locally preserves all the angles. Okay, so you have, if you have a rotation, a translation or a scale transformation where you blow up things, then locally the angles are the same. But nevertheless, this is a very strong symmetry and actually there are very few examples in nature where, where we have the scale symmetry. I mean, this is a conformal symmetry. This is something rather rare actually. But here in this particular quantum field theory, this happens. And if you have this huge amount of symmetry, then you can, I mean, the more symmetries you have, the easier the, your life gets because then the calculations become a lot easier. Okay. So it's the more symmetric things are, the less parameters I need to describe my physical system. And so normally if I calculate the observables in the quantum field theory, so that for instance, the so-called correlation functions, which are examples for observables, then uh, in such a conformal field theory, they are determined up to a very small number of parameters. So in QCD, which is not conformally invariant, if I calculate the uh, cross sections and, and so on, and observables, I have to do a perturbative expansion and approximation, and it's all uh, very cumbersome. But here, because I have so much symmetry, I can almost write down the results just based on the symmetry. Okay. And that's why people use this example. So it's not, it, it does, this particular theory doesn't describe anything in nature, but it, it's very easy to calculate with, and it has a lot of symmetry. And now the interesting thing is that the symmetries in this field theory are the same as the symmetries of this anti sitter space. <clears throat> So the symmetry groups, so uh, physicists or theoretical physicists write symmetries in terms of mathematical groups. So a group is a mathematical structure that describes a symmetry. And the symmetries of an anti sitter space in D plus one dimensions is the same as this symmetry group of this conformal field theory in one dimension less. Okay, and that's actually a, a key why this duality between the field theory and the gravity theory works because we have this holographic principle, which tells us that the number of degrees of freedom is the same in the two theories. And now I also tell you that the symmetries are very strong and they are the same in the two theories. Now if we, for a physicist, if you say I have two theories and they have the same amount of degrees of freedom and they have the same symmetry, then a physicist will always conclude that it means that this theory must be the same. Okay, of course, that's not a mathematical proof. Okay, mathematicians, they, they would be horrified with the statement, but okay, I'm a physicist, so I'm allowed to say this. So, so if I tell you I have two theories and they have the same amount of symmetry and they have the same amount of degrees of freedom, they just got to be the same. Okay, and, and, and so that's what the essence of this, why this duality works. 
Okay, but then now you can ask, is there any question about this? I mean, before I move on. Okay, I mean, does it make sense what I'm saying? Are you totally overwhelmed or, or have you heard this before? I mean, <laughs> for me, it's very hard to tell. So can, can I ask this elementary question about uh, symmetry? So you know, you the, you call it the gauge gravity duality, yeah. And uh, but I think in this uh, discussion, you were emphasizing the conformal symmetry, but the conformal symmetry is not a gauge symmetry. Exactly. So, but yeah. uh, so, but the gauge symmetry is also it's important for there to be a gauge symmetry for the duality to hold. Yes. Right? Very good question. Excellent question, and I will okay. describe this. Okay. So this theory is so symmetric; it, it has a lots of different types of symmetries, okay? It has a gauge symmetry, which I will come to later. And it has, and there's this conformal symmetry and it also has supersymmetry, okay? So now conformal symmetry and supersymmetry, they're examples of so-called global symmetries, whereas the gauge symmetry is an example of a so-called local symmetry, which means that the parameter depends on space and time, okay? And it's in fact these global symmetries that occur both in the field theory and the gravity theory, whereas the gauge symmetry of the quantum field theory you cannot directly see in the in the gravity theory. So um, the, the, these symmetries are treated on a different footing. Excellent question. So the, the 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 gauge symmetry is distinct from this conformal symmetry. So so this theory is a gauge theory and on top of it is conformally invariant and supersymmetric. So these are three different symmetries, two of which are global and one is a local symmetry. And the statements I've been making here about the symmetry groups coinciding and so on, these are statements about the global symmetries. Okay, very good question. Okay, anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so uh, like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, just to, yeah, thanks, that was very helpful. And just to, so, uh, you know, when you hear the name gauge gravity duality, you imagine that it's the gauge symmetry that's essential for a duality to hold. But what you said just now suggests that you, uh, so I guess one way of asking my question, do you imagine, is the, are there dualities where the field theory does, ha does not have a gauge symmetry at all, but just has the conformal and the supersymmetry? Uh, not, in, I, I think, wait, Okay, so in this restricted scenario that I'm talking about here in the context of the ADSC mm. correspondence, they are all gauge theories. Okay. Uh, but if you go more widely in the context of physics, I mean, there's other dualities, um, which I mentioned this duality between the massive theory and the sine Gordon model, but that's, that's not a duality okay. involving gravity, but the, these theories are not gauge theories, like for instance. Okay, so. Um, but it's an excellent question. I will give you more details as we move along. Okay. Um, so I will come back to this point. Um, so just for now, I think you should remember that here I'm talking about the global symmetries, not the local symmetries. And where the, I, I will tell you what happens to this gauge degrees of freedom um, in a few slides. Okay. Good. But before I get there, I have to take a slight detour because, okay, you should, should say, uh, at this stage, you should tell me, yeah, why should I believe this? Okay, you should say, okay, fine, you tell me I have two theories, one has gravity, the other doesn't, um, and you tell me they have the same amount of these views of freedom, and uh, they have a lot of symmetry and the same symmetry, and I've been advocating now that they should be the same, or they should be dual to each other, okay? But then you should still ask, but why on earth did you come up with this example? Okay. Uh, it's still extremely non-trivial, okay, that I can do a quantum calculation in a flat space. And then on the other hand, can do a gravity classical calculation and get exactly the same result for some physical observables by doing a completely different calculation. And that's actually what's happening. I will show you examples where you can do a quantum computation in a flat space on the one hand side and you do a gravity calculation in curved space on the other side. And you get exactly the same result by doing two very complicated but very different computations. So 
you know, how should anybody ever have thought about this? Okay, and the reason is string theory. Without string theory, this would ha not have been found. Okay, so so that's why I'm going to explain now a little bit about strings. I'm going to take a slight detour and explain a few things about string theory that we need to know. And then it will become much more obvious. And so coming back to the question that you asked at the very beginning, you know, where are the strings? So this will be the answer now. Um, so we need to know a few facts of string theory because without string theory, nobody would ever have thought about these things, okay? It, it would appear as a very strange coincidence, but it's actually a consequence of string theory, okay? So that's why we need to talk about strings a little bit. Okay, so I'm not, now I'm taking a slight detour about string theory, but I'm just going to tell you those aspects of string theory that we need to, um, to, to, to understand um, gauge gravity duality and the ADS-CFT correspondence. Okay, so I guess you have all have heard about string theory. So uh, this was developed uh, as a, in the quest for a unified theory of fundamental interaction. So it provides a quantum theory of gravitation. Okay, we might discuss if it's the unique, the right and real one, but it does provide a quantum theory of gravitation. And it describes the standard model of elementary particles and gravity in a unified framework. Also, this we can certainly also say about string theory. And it reduces, leads to a reduction of the number of free parameters in, in the standard model. Okay. So, so string, uh, string theory is really a candidate for, for providing all of these um, aspects. Um, so the question is, how can we have a unified theory of gravitation and the standard model in a unified context? Um, well, we have to provide a quantum theory of gravitation, but okay, there's all these issues that if you quantize gravity in the standard way, it's not renormalizable, and then the theory doesn't make sense and so on. But string theory, uh, by the fact that the elementary particles are extended objects and not just point-like, um, so the locality is abandoned at very short distances, um, then we naturally have a cutoff um, that makes all our integrals finite and uh, ensures um, a finite uh, regular quantum field theory. And this cutoff is provided by the length of the string. Okay, but these strings, um, so the length of the strings will be made out of un, um, you know universal constants, namely h bar, the Newton constant, and the velocity of light to the third power. So if you combine this in in such a way, and you get something which is of the unit of a length, yeah, but it gives you this absolutely tiny length, okay, which is far beyond uh, observation at any particle accelerator, okay, by 15 orders of magnitude, it's impossible to resolve at such small scales. But nevertheless, conceptually, it's very interesting that you have this length, which makes your theory finite. Okay, so direct experimentalist tests are, are not possible today. Okay, I mean, I, I think that's a very useful euphemistic statement, of course, I mean, also, I think in the next 20, 30 years, ago, it will not be possible to directly test this experimentally because, I mean, this is really far off any particle accelerator that we can build. Okay, um, but the important point now in our context is that string theory actually provides the framework for gauge gravity duality. You can use string theory as a set of mathematical equations, which very naturally gives you this duality between gravity and quantum field theory. Okay, so let me tell you about a few features of uh, string theory that we need. And so one feature is that on the one hand side, we have open strings. And uh, uh, on the other hand, we have closed strings. Okay, so open strings, um, so string, really means the string of a violin or a guitar or piano. Okay, so where the two endpoints, they are fixed somewhere, and then you have some, um, some vibrations, some fluctuations, which, you know, there's the lowest mode where the string just does this, okay. 
Uh, so imagine you have your violin or guitar, and if you, you strike a very low tone, it just does this. Okay, it doesn't have a lot of wiggles, just a small. <clears throat> and the small amount of wiggles is like a dipole moment, and that's why this corresponds to a gauge field because it's a spin one object to this just this field A mu. Okay, so essentially these gauge degrees of freedom of the standard model that we were talking about, so the gauge symmetry. Okay. Uh, that's associated to the open strings in, in string theory. <coughs> okay, and closed strings, um, they look like this, and then you can show, so now, I, unfortunately, I can't show because my hand is in the plaster, okay. <laughs> Do you know what a quadrupole is? So this is, if you have your circle and it like, requires like this, like that, like this, like that, okay. So, so this is a quadrupole moment. The quadruple moment is a matrix with two indices, and that provides you with a graviton. Okay, so the fluctuation modes, the, the lowest energy fluctuation modes of the string is a quadruple moment, which corresponds to a metric, and metric gives you gravity theories. Okay, and whereas the open strings, they give you gauge theories without the gravity. Okay, so and essentially we just have two types of degrees of freedom: the open and the closed strings. The open strings they give us um, gauge fields and the closed strings, they give us a metric, a graviton. Okay. Good. I guess uh, the break is coming up. So maybe uh, should we take a break here and I will continue there after the break. Mm -hmm.